sorry about that. I'm sorry, James. Yeah. The, the images of people doing active things with server images. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> no, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Very kind. All right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't make that was made for an AB show, so I'm sorry about that. But um. So I'm gonna. Shall I start? Yeah. So I'm going to talk about putting software runnable pieces of code in a folder, in the actual name of a folder, and running it, which is a bit of an odd thing to do. So I'm going to basically start talking about virtual file systems. So the file system I've got here isn't really dealing with files on a disk. It's actually just using a file system API as if it were a programming interface. And I like playing with basically finding out where the limits of something is. Yeah, what go as far as breaking it and then come back a little bit and then you know what the edge of something is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about virtual file systems and basically what a function call means in a VFS. And then I'm going to give you some simple examples of how to use just text with semantic meaning in a folder to make things to order. And then I'm going to start showing you some Python actually running in folders. And then we're going to get a bit more fun and um, we'll try and find out where the edges of it is. And also, we're going to find out how stupidly not insecure this might be. So the idea of running arbitrary code in your file server is not the best idea for security. But actually, you know, th th there may be ways through this that aren't ridiculous. So we'll see. So I'm more than happy to take heckling at any point. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a principal software architect, whatever that means. Um, that means I code every day, and I'm arm waiver in chief. So I like whiteboards and I like coding. Um, I've been coding for nearly 40 years, which is quite scary because I'm only 47. And um, I've been in my current role for nearly 20 years, which is also quite scary. But um, I like researching stuff. So I ship code. I've got lots of customers, but I like doing research. And so the research at work is about file systems and browser-based video editing. And the research at university... Um, it's quite funny, actually. All I wanted, I've got a friend who's another doctor. I said, can I have a library card? And so he made me a visiting research fellow at Brunel, which is very nice of him. Um, but actually, all it is is he's got a beer budget and he just wants someone, someone to share it with, which is even more fun. So I won't go on about Snell uh, Advanced Media too much, but basically we do special effects and TV and film. So basically, if you watch ESPN Sports Centre, it's made on our kit. And we also have one customer that does lots of dimensionalizing. So most of the stereo films that come out of Hollywood have gone through this weird file system I'm about to show you, which is quite frightening. Sorry about that. OK, so what we're going to do. Um, I'm about to show you some code that's a video editor and an effects engine. And it's written in C++ and normally runs on CUDA. But I haven't got any GPUs in this little thing. So things aren't fast. But I'm going to show you concepts. And we've got, basically, a number of interfaces into the code base, one of which is a user interface. So I can just go through. So it's basically a video editor. And I haven't got very exciting footage on here, but um, basically there's lots of parameters and all sorts of stuff you can do to manipulate video. Um, and a while ago, I started putting in a different interface to this code base, which is an SMB interface. That's quite an odd thing to do. But basically, I'm putting a folder system on the top of the code base that is a video editor. And then I can do all the functionality I've got in my user interface in a file system, because I thought that would be a fun thing to try to do. So I've been doing that a little while. But last year, I also embedded Python hosted in the C++ process. So now I've got the C++ and CUDA and a Python interpreter. And now we've got a really nice, rich API we give to people that's normal Python code. And I thought, well, if I've got a VFS SMB interpreter server and a Python interpreter, it'd be rude not to just try to see where we can do joining up of those two things, see what happens. What I've been playing with is the idea of using Python to build a domain-specific language for editing. So I'd like to take a clip and subclip it make a segment, it's called. Or I'd like to take a clip and adjust its saturation. 
So I want to make little functions that can represent semantically rich meaning for editing. And this touches a little bit on functional programming. I'm not going to talk about functional programming in depth. But the DSL basically is a piece of text I'd like to store and run as a program. And I was thinking, well, what if I could actually put that text in the actual folder structure? What would happen? So then I tried using Python to build a little parser to actually build a little DSL. And I realized suddenly that I was just re-implementing Python in Python. It was just like, no, what, let's use Python as the DSL. So that's where we got to. So I am sorry for what I'm about to show you. It's a bit naughty. Um, it isn't shipping code. And um, yeah, I really have in my life tried to ask for forgiveness, not permission, when you approach something. So that's quite fun. So do heckle. Right, just to give you a little bit of background, um, SMB, what is it? SMB servers prescribe basically a bunch of semantics and function calls that need to be honored over a network. And the basically behind the SMB standard is in a set of assumptions about what is behind it. So you've got semantics implied in that. If I write a file, I'm gonna be able to read that file again later in that folder, unless I've got to change notify. So as long as you honor those semantics, once you've worked out what they are, you can do anything you like in your SMB server. You know, you can go and brew a cup of tea if you want. Um, in fact, I gave a talk two years ago about how long you can delay your responses. And it turns out that some of them can be infinite, which is quite interesting. Okay, so the file contents also don't need to be predetermined. So there's a thing called the Turing test from many moons ago. If you've got two things you're talking to, one's a hurt person and one's a computer, can you tell them apart? And Turing was trying to say that artificial intelligence was going to be able to basically hide the fact of whether you're talking to a human or a computer. And this is a bit sort of analogous, which is, uh, if I'm calling an API, can I tell if it's a real file server or something weird? And the, as long as I basically answer in a way that doesn't surprise the client, then we're in a good place. So the SMB protocol can be seen as a sort of API gateway. It's a bunch of function calls. So just because I've got a DIR and a bunch of files in a folder doesn't mean that if I do create file looking for an open on a file that isn't in that folder, I can't reply saying, yeah, it's here. And that one technique, open a file that already exists, but it's not DIR listed, is fine. And you can do quite a lot with it. So let's just start with some simple demos. Take my glasses off now. It's bad when you get to the age where you have to swap glasses all the time, isn't it? Anyway. So I'm just going to start with uh, get a browser together. So I've got a, just a browser going to IIS that's resting on top of the file system I'm offering. And I'm just going to paste in a little path. And obviously, this is far too small. So I've got the, can you see that? Can you read the path? Cool. So we're just going after um, demo semicolon 1330.jpg. And demo semicolon's a bit of an odd folder name. And it's made a little file. That wasn't in the file system when I actually opened up the um, create file call. And here, I can just type in an arbitrary number, say 800. And I've coded that to program the sizer in my video editor. So these files have got semantic meaning to the server, but they're just text to the client. That's the, what's going on. So then here, we can change that. I'm just going to put in, oops, can't type. So basically then, I've just made a little bitmap. So it's a JPEG, a bitmap. I'm just asking for whatever mime type I like. And the IIS is going, oh, OK. I'm going to see if it's in the fol folder system. And my folder system's going, yeah, yeah, of course, it was there all along. And it's made it for you. So that principle, then, I've got this one in direction, allows me to play. But we'll go back to the boring slides before we do more demos. Cool. Right. So we've got arbitrary strings that can be posted off to an SMB server, and you get back an answer. So if you make a folder in Explorer and you type colon, you get this little thing saying, well, you can't have these nine characters. But that means 
you've got all of these other ones in ASCII still left. So the non-alphanumerics, basically, if anyone knows Python, imagine what damage you can do with those characters. We're about to find out. So we can do functions, that's nice. We can do commas, that means we can do function parameter separators. And single quotes, that's nice too. And then we can do things like square brackets, so comprehensions, dictionary comprehensions. That means we can do for loops and all sorts of stuff. We can do a semicolon. Now, Python's notorious for its white space layout. It doesn't have curly brackets, you have to indent everything. But it turns out there's a little known thing, which is you can get a statement and put a semicolon on the end of it and put another statement on the same line. So it doesn't even need white space. And you can do equality and inequality tests. Right, so more demos. That's good. Right, am I making any sense so far? Okay, we're just... Yeah, we're we'll starting. So we're leaving Kansas now. Uh, oh, let's start with him. Right, so before I run that, I'm going to zoom in. What have we got? MS Paint is the installed Windows Paint application, and we're going to go to a, a folder called Compose Semicolon Timeline Bracket, 1220.bim. <coughs> cool. So MS Paint has just opened a bitmap. And that bitmap has got nice colourful sort of parachute thing in it. That's fine. What we've actually done then is we've basically, that folder has got some semantics. And I'll go into what that is first, but I'll give you one more demo. Yeah, that should work. So let's zoom in again, see if we can see it. So this time we're doing timeline with brackets, and that's returning something that's been passed as a parameter to a function called sat and another parameter called zero. I'm setting the saturation of whatever's returned to zero and then asking for a bitmap of that. And it's just programmed the color corrector in our code. Hello. Say again? So in the research I've done so far, I haven't looked at write. I'm just looking at read. And I've got certain use cases. But I have got future ideas about what we could do with write. Let me get to the end of the talk, and you'll see how evil that could be. But, um, <laughs> very happy to um, see where we can go with this. And it is just an idea, but it seems like a quite a fun idea to pursue. OK, so what have I just done? I've just done MS Paint opening up stuff. But we're a video company, so we need to see some video. Honky dog calls. No, 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 it's not working with the glasses front, is it? So when MS Paint goes away, does that destroy the entire project? Well, MS Paint is just looking at a folder that's containing a file, and it doesn't know anything about it. The lifetime of the file um, is completely up to the SMB server, what it does. So I've got actually folders that offer JPEGs, and they've got an a, a arbitrary 200 file limit. So they'll offer up stuff, and they'll just garbage collect the oldest and throw them away if they've not got handles open still. So now what we're going to do... So here, we're just going to ask VLC, which is just a, a video player on the internet, to play along essence, um, this timeline thing, uh, using something called an MXF file, which is an industry standard for broadcast sort of media file that VLC plays. Windows Media Player doesn't. So what I've just done is I'm playing along an MXF file that is a minute long. I don't know if you can see that. Is that going to work? I haven't tried that. So you can see it's a one minute long file. And really, VLC doesn't really know anything. I might turn the volume down. <laughs> so actually what I've done, the file I'm editing is on my C drive, the thing that the video editor has open. So this file here is the file that I've mounted into this editor, which I've just re-exposed in the virtual file system, and it's identical. So what have we done? We've got an MXF file on the C drive that's gone to a Z drive MXF file. The only thing I've done is the classic computer science evil and indirection. 
we can do stuff between my virtual file and the original source file. Cool. So just to explain before we do any more demos, that folder path that we've been looking at is basically, I've, got to, I've made up a little bit of semantics, uh, idiomatic syntax, if you like, where I look for a string, semicolon string. And in my actual VFS layer, the, fig, the string before the semicolon, I look for that file name .py in the local C drive in a certain folder. And then the string that follows the semicolon, I just call eval on it in Python, which is evil. And we'll come into how we can limit its evilness later. But just to... So this is the, um, a file called compose.py, which we're going to be using for the rest of the talk. And basically, it's really simple bits of Python. That this QPython wrapper is the boost C++ mappings I've put into Python of the whole of the, virtual, the um, effects and um, editing system we've got. And then it just does simple things like timeline is, go and get me the system timeline, please, as a clip. And we've seen things like, um, we run a sat. Yeah. Oh, I don't know how to drive this zoom in thing. So we've seen the effect of SAT, which basically I've got lots of parameters, I've set up lots of hard-coded stuff for this demo. But basically SAT just takes a value and applies it to the, uh, an effect to that clip and then um, returns a clip. So these are all um, functions that have no side effect because they take a, take a parameter and return a wrapper or a change to a clip, returning up the data, same data structure. Okay, do some more demos. So, we've already seen then that we can do things like um, function parameters, but demos are no fun unless you have audience interaction. So, let's see if we can get that. Cool, do a bit of that. I don't know. Just need to change that because I got that wrong last time. So, can I have a name, please, other than James? Shout out, random word, please. Audience into, hmm? Bob. Bob, with a capital, or I'll just do a lowercase Bob. All right then. So, at the bottom, we see, hello, Bob. So we've just taken a bit of text that's in a string and run it in Python and applied it to the world that is our little effects editor and then made up a picture. That's a really silly thing to do. But actually, it turns out it's quite useful. So we're on set, and we aren't on set, our customers are, and they're recording lots of really valuable new film footage, and they've got people, like producers, who'd like to look at that film footage, but they're not on set. So it's really nice to watermark things instantly, because then you can blame people when things get stolen. They, they, the Hollywood love that. Oh, yes, yes. It was Jeremy what done it. All that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> wouldn't possibly comment anyway so we've done a bit of oh yes seg that's fun so we did a sat earlier but we'll do a seg so i've just shown you that uh, essence.mxf being one minute long so let's go and open this again now this time i've just put it t instead of timeline it's, a bit, it's the same function i've just shortened it and we're basically putting some parameters with the t to make something called a segment, which is basically a subclip. Now we'll turn off the segment. So then we've now got a subclip that's only eight seconds long, but it, we haven't really done anything. Doing this in a real file system, what would you have to do? You take a one minute long MXF file, and then you have to be able to parse the internals of it. You have to understand the structures inside it and the fact it's video inside it. And then you have to pull out a section of it, put another header down, and then offer it up. And we've just avoided all of that rubbish by putting something in a folder structure that's semantically meaningful to the server. And you can't do that in a normal file system because they're not content aware. They don't understand what they store. And that's what we're playing with, the idea of content aware storage. Cool. All right, so I think I've demoed so far um, functions with taking parameters. But there's another thing. We've got these square brackets to play with. So what can we do with square brackets? They're lists in Python. So it's a proper data structure. So let's see what we can do with those. Oh, we can do that one first. 
So here then, we T twice in a list. Anyone, any idea what it's going to do? Any guesses? Exactly. So we've got exactly the same file again, but if I were to zoom in down here, we've now got a two minute clip, not a one minute clip, and it just repeats in the middle. And if I go to the middle, that's the end of the clip, and then it repeats. Cool. And then, yeah, we can do sub ranges. So these things are nicely composable. So we've got that little four second section again, but this time we're just repeating that four second section. I'm not going to show you really rich, powerful editing. I'm just showing you the principle of how far you can go with this um, silly idea. Let's run down the rabbit hole. Cool. Right, who knows what that sort of code means? Well, it's basically, it says it at the top. There's something in Python called a comprehension. And a comprehension is a way to basically do a for loop that doesn't need a colon. So I like that one. Yeah, let's go and play with um, colon feed for loops in Python. It's not the best title name ever, is it? Colon feed. Oh, well, I'll stop now. <laughs> right. Quite enough of that. I'll be off soon, don't worry. So what we're going to do, I know it's wrapped over, we've got seg timeline, and then we've got basically x in x range 100. So that means it's going to, be, oh, is it going south, is it? It wasn't me, Governor, I promise. Right, so basically we're going to do a, if 100 iterations of this little subclip thing. And so now we can see, if we go and hover in the evil list department, 6 minutes 40 long. And yet it's the same four second footage over and over again. Cool. So when you generate this, are you actually generating a file with all this in? Yeah, in absolutely. So VLC is playing a flat MXF file and it hasn't got a clue anything's going on. I've not adjusted MS Paint or VLC or IIS or Windows Client. All of this is shipping bespoke, no, normal Windows software and I'm adding semantics to it in spite of that software, not by changing the client at all. So these are things that are a little bit odd to do. I'll just go through some a little analysis. So this is probably the most insecure file system on the planet. I'm quite proud of that. that, that <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> But let's just follow the dots again about security. So um, we also, SMB, we know we can sign every packet. So that means at least we can avoid a man in the middle. So someone can't impose a bit of Python in the middle of our little conversation. We can also encrypt all the time. So that means people can't even tell we're doing this, you know, by parsing it and being sniffing. Our particular market, we do know our clients. We're a vertical niche market. We have numbers of hundreds of clients. We have relationships with them. So we can persuade them that this is a good idea, I think. I don't know. But um, the other thing, though, technically, Python, we can limit it. So I wanted a domain-specific language, and I've shown you I can start using the whole, or nearly the whole of Python. But now we need to bring that back into the DSL I actually wanted. So I'm using this thing called eval. And eval takes three parameters, a string to run, and then in, uh, two other things. Oh, have I gone blank again? Hmm? Okay. Um, it's a string to run, and then these other things, globals and locals. And you can override globals and locals. So it's a bit of code. It's not very readable, but basically, I get a little list, and I say all the functions I'm going to allow that are my little DSL. And then I can also basically remove any things I don't want to allow. So I remove the built-ins. And so basically, when I do eval params with this, this safe dictionary, it will only allow those function calls to be run. So I can't call os.rmdir, for example, which I could if I didn't do that, which is probably a bad thing. Now, we've got a bit of, bit of fun now. Last night, I got a hotfix from Microsoft, which was all very exciting. And this morning, my demo didn't work of this bit. So I do apologize. And when I get back to the Plugfest, it will be fixed today. But um, that's all part of the fun of being an SMB server implementer. Um, so, but the, what I was going to show you is that I could do os.rmdirjames, 
with, when I did a vial on it, it would run it. But when I do this technique with the built-ins turned off, it says, computer says no. And it didn't run it. And, you get, and also, I even dumped the little stack in um, my little log I've got of the call stack that's going on. It says no, computer says no. So we'll get that fixed today, but sorry, I can't show you that. Cool. Now, we've also got some other problems. I mean, as a concept, this is quite problematic, but let's see if we can try and bash over some of the problems. So we're not allowed to use colon. So that means I can't do if while loops and things like that. But then I was talking to Matthew George yesterday, and he said that the SMB client redirector doesn't really look at symbols, so you can do what you want. So, all of that rubbish about not being able to use nine of the ASCII character set things is wrong. Let's see, uh, where did I put that? Oh, we can just write it. So just as an example, I've given it a list, and then there's a thing in Python called a slice, which is a square brackets with a colon. Can you see that? You've got basically a two there. So basically, I'm giving it a list of three things and then asking for the first two. Oops, be help if I. And that works. So you can put colons through. It's very exciting. So my initial analysis of not being allowed to uh, use those nine symbols is wrong. In fact, nearly everything in this presentation is wrong, but we'll come back to that. But um, I can't use white space in the you know, laying out of things, so I can't have control blocks. But actually, we're only running expressions, not full um, statements anyway. And that turns out to be a good thing. So the assignment statement isn't allowed in eval. And why is that good? So I'm going to make a function call, you know, create file. And if I have assignments, I can start building up state in the Python interpreter so that the next time I haven't got the same device as I came to the last time. Whereas with this, just evaling, I haven't got the ability to build up state. Every call is ephemeral. It makes a file, but it doesn't leave any state in the Python interpreter to be then rested upon or abused later on. So it's, again, a bit functional in that I can do these calls and they'll always have the same meaning. There won't be side effects. And that means then I've got a URL like this and I can mail it to someone who's also got access to my file share and they'll get the same result. So it's therefore got a nice property, which is you can't abuse it in that sense. There's a few other bits. Where I was, when I wrote this, I hadn't talked to Matthew George, and I haven't yet tried backslashes and forward slashes and greater and less than. But the workarounds for a number of these are quite easy. The one thing I've never got working, which I haven't listed on here, is star to do multiply, because I want to be able to multiply stuff together. I can do most of the other mathematical operations. But actually, just a little function called mull, and then I can get work around that. OK, so this is a stupid idea, because there's only 260 characters allowed, isn't there? No. So there's two mitigations to the short line length problem. One is um, question mark UNC. Cool. <coughs> deep, 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 deep. Let's see if we can find a long, here's one I prepared earlier. Classic, um, I remember Blue Peter? Mm. Anyway, sorry, one person will. <coughs> so, um, mouth, glasses, whilst talking, not working. Okay, so here then, we've got a long path and we've got this UNC thing at the front of it. And that basically allows us to do 32K of software in the folder structure. So that's now past that path. But it turns, turns out also, when I was researching this, that um, a new, newish version of Windows 10 has got a registry setting to turn off the limiting of long paths globally. And you can also put in a manifest in a piece of software to say, I understand long paths, if you want to. That isn't useful in our case, because I can't do that to the SMB client sort of thing. But um, I think then there is potentially no limit to the length of these paths. Well, that's, I'm not yet, I haven't yet researched because the Windows 10 documentation doesn't state a limit now. It says the limit's been removed. The file system has a limit. The 32K now comes from NTFS. No. But you're not going through NTFS. No, no. There's nothing to do with NTFS. So what's the, so you don't have to the limit list. Oh, sorry, I can't hear. You don't have a limit. Yeah. I think, yeah, so this potentially is limitless. 
we can have a gigabyte of software on it. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Okay. That's enough, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't, I mean, but then there must be, there's other ways. Yes. But these, these are just demos of a concept which is... Yes. So it's basically a create file call, is all I'm expecting things to call. Yeah? Oh, it's fascinating. Ooh, that, we've got lots of fun to have this afternoon, then. Excellent. Cool. Now, when I actually started getting long paths working, we used this data structure from the Windows headers in our own code. And there's an evil thing in the middle of it called max path, which is 260. So um, I actually found a bug in our software, which is it didn't cope with long paths until I did this demo. So it's quite fun. But if you were to no, start playing with this sort of idea yourself, which is probably quite unlikely, admittedly, then... Um, yeah, that's something to look out for. There are hard-coded max paths throughout um, our legacy from Windows. Cool. So I also had trouble with capitalization. And this is a nice thorny topic between the Linux Windows community and all that sort of stuff. But um, it turns out that the um, SMB completely honors capitalization. And what I've found, though, is that because we sometimes use IIS on top of our SMB server, IIS can sometimes lowercase a string before it asks for it. So there's Windows applications that may not be case sensitive or case preserving. Oh, hello, was that a no. but, um, but the actual, the protocol itself and the implementations of the client redirector and our server are case preserving. So then I did hello James or hello Bob or whatever with a case and it works. It's just that the, there are some applications that don't. Now, this is fun. So if I put in 2.5, what does that mean as a file or something in a folder? And it turns out that some applications, again, this is an application level thing, will see the point as the start of the MIME type, the file type. So IIS sees this as five close bracket as a MIME type, which isn't in its MIME list, and then says no, computer says no. Um, whereas SMB doesn't care, it doesn't have any semantic meaning. So doing Floating point numbers as parameters in this can have side effects that are a bit odd. But I'm just looking at the boundaries of what you can do. Oh, question. So could you um, find a, a character that would basically be Polish um, period or something? Yes. Well, you could do escape sequences, all sorts. But I'm just yeah. seeing to, I wanted to get as pure Python as possible. I'm trying to see, what I, see, yeah. see how much pure, well, hello. MS SMB2 dot spec in 2.2.13 lets me do credit request. Name length is a usual. Unsure. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Oh, right. So we're back to 32k. 64k. Oh, it's unsigned at least. Let's see. Let's see if we can see where we can get to. That's it. Let's do as much to break it as we can. Cool. So, okay, this is a stupid thing to do. But why do this? A, because I like research and I like breaking stuff. But um, file systems really are pervasive. They're all over the place. Every piece of software on the planet somehow interacts with a file. I can't think of anything that doesn't really have a file system underneath it. And with this sort of technique, you can add new features to software that you haven't got permission to edit. So closed source stuff can add new semantics. So I can use these paths and store them, say, in Adobe Photoshop in its little settings file and it'll open a file and suddenly it's getting access to pictures that have had semantic meaning from the server but it doesn't know I've done that. It also allows us to be lazy which I've heard in America is pejorative so just in time rather than just in case but I like being lazy because I'm British. So, um, uh, so basically we're doing things reactively and that means um, our customers, a lot of them say the sports customers, they can't predict when something's going to happen, like a program over runs or someone hits a home run. And so they need to be able to react really quickly. But a lot of the software built in our industry, it reads along a file, presuming it's open and locked just for it and fully formed, and then does a batch mode conversion to make a different version of it to then later on the process in series uploads it to the web. So you've got live production not being able to put stuff onto the actual web 
to be able to stream it at the same time as broadcasting it. That sort of problem is pervasive in our industry. All these processes happen in series. With this sort of technique, I can run things in parallel because these files are virtual, I can make them to order and then get things to react to things more quickly. So it makes us agile. There's a more philosophical thing, I'm allowed to do that, PhD, um, which is I'm going to give you a tin of beans and ask you to get the tomatoes out of it. And I don't think you can because it's rendered, it's been cooked. But if we can keep recipes separate from the ingredients rather than baked cakes, baked beans, then um, we've, we're in a world where we can be more agile because we haven't lost anything. So file systems are fundamentally destructive because if I write a file, I don't record who did it and what process they used to actually build the file content. So if I render a flat video file, I don't know what source files were used to make that. Some bits of academia have started looking at uh, provenance-aware file systems, they're called. So they say, this file was made with this process, and look at, look, they look at the process. These are all the files that this process touched in order to make this file. So they've got a graph, at least. So you can follow back and say, these files must have influenced this. But it's very woolly. In our industry, in video editing, every time I make a flat thing, I've lost. Because I've lost things like copyright. I don't know what went into it. So we've got Formula One, and they've used footage uh, in the news or something like that from Formula One, and Sky gets sued if they use more than 30 seconds in a day because they haven't got a license for more than that. So they need to know where bits of media have ended up in a file. So having recipes that are live with ingredients and not pre-baking things gives us more power. So it's just a, something to be debated. So the other thing I'm going to research is... If I've got a recipe inside my model, can I expose those recipes using this technique so that other things can pick up on the construction, the recipe that's been used to build the file? So you can have other things writing it or expose it with this sort of property. Okay. And, oh, oh question. So, theoretically, you can create programming by having people drag and drop folders. Yes, very much, which is fundamentally hatios, except I can't say it. Who can say that word? REST, you know, the bit in REST. Hypermedia is the engine of application state. We're doing a RESTful file system, and I'm following the REST idiom and putting it in a file system properly rather than just HTTP. I haven't tried, as an aside, any of these other OSs yet. But, um, um, yeah, well, I'll see one. Yeah, I think it shouldn't be too surprising. Um, there is definitely a, a vulnerability here in terms of uh, what other applications get surprised by these paths. And to answer the question from earlier on, I haven't really researched the impact of writing back through. But there could be an interesting space. So say I've got, um, I've done just cut editing, and a bit of software writes through one of these to a piece of video saying it's overwriting something. I can actually know where it was going to apply that to the original source, because I've still got the recipe, if you, see what, if you follow me. So I've got cut, 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 and it writes in the middle of the file to the second cut. I can reapply that to every use of the, that piece of media, wherever it was, say. Because I know where it came from, and then it came through a particular recipe. As I said earlier, though, these are research ideas, and um, I really haven't considered how I might use this, if I might use this in production. But it seemed like a fun thing to chat about and play with. Cool. All right, so... Um, once you've got a virtual file system... Oh, there's a question. Hello. No question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The last thing that you just mentioned looks like a doctor file for video editing. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, just to sum up, summarise then. Once you've got a virtual file system, you're not in Kansas anymore. You can do other things than normal classic store things and return them file systems can't do. And that's a fun space to play in. Um, and I mentioned delaying things earlier. Um, yeah, so you really can, if you run with this a little bit, do quite a lot of things and haven't run out of ideas of what you might be able to do with it yet. But I just thought I'd share where we got to. But it does rely on, basically, if you're going to have a Python interpreter or something, you need a model to push against. If you're going to have these files, video is a perfect space, but there probably are other spaces that could benefit from this sort of 
manipulation of the model to produce a file or just views of things, things like that. Okay, so we've got to the end and I didn't blue screen. <laughs> Question? Speaking of blue screen, so is this a kernel file system on, on Windows? No, no, it's user mode. Okay. Yeah, so it is this application. This application is, um, so Dave Cruze gave me some code that turns off uh, NetBT and leaves server service running, yeah. and it, therefore 445 gets freed up. And you're listening on 445, yeah. so you are an SMB server. You're yeah, running. that's it. So you're running Sam with that? No, 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 no. But we, this afternoon we were going to um, possibly, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's it. So now that we've got um, Ubuntu on Windows, yeah. we, we, and because I've turned 445 off, yeah. then we can actually run Samba in Ubuntu. Oh. And we're going to play with that this afternoon. It's, it's a fun, a user mode SMB server on Windows. There's so many things I could say now which would get me flamed, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, I, I don't know. Okay, that's it. Any other questions from this daft idea? <coughs> oh, hello. So be, before you put production, I would really get some security with you. Oh, yeah. No, because um, there's loads of things you can do in Python to build strings to go and do meta and come back yeah. down. And Yeah, no, I realise it may be um, challenging. But for a, for a constrained... You know, Lots of us customers have closed networks. Yeah. Broadcast networks aren't on the internet, yeah. for example. Or, or even just running over VPN over the internet. Yeah. Something else. That's a perfect way to... Yes, exactly that. So the use of SMB is just a facilitator. Yeah. I'm not that interested in SMB as the people in the Plugfest have found out over the years. But um, I'm more interested in the property of having a file system interface to operating systems and what you can do with that. So I think we're good. All right, well, thank you very much. <laughs>